Thank you very much for um, inviting me, and it's a great pleasure to be here today as the relatively new um, director of the Ruskin uh, Library, Museum and Research Centre at Lancaster. So I thought I might be slightly ambitious and try and talk about, as this is Ruskin's bicentenary year, and we're thinking about what the next 200 years worth of Ruskin might be, to talk about here, um, a 360 degree view of Ruskin's thinking for the next 200 years, possibly. And um, I wanted to do that uh, as we have recently wrapped and unwrapped. This is the Ruskin Library. We've refurbished it and reopened it for the bicentenary year. For those of you who don't know, the Ruskin White House collection is an unparalleled collection of materials relating to Ruskin and his circle in the 19th century. Houses thousands of books and manuscripts, paintings and drawings, daguerreotypes, prints and photographs. And as I said, they offer a 360 degree view of the origins of Ruskin's thinking his contemporary reception and affirm his role as a catalyst of innovation in social, political and environmental practices. So if I'm defining my title by Ruskin, I mean not the man with the long beard for the purposes of today, but this collection. And I want to play with this idea of what next year's words or the next 200 years worth of words uh, on Ruskin might be. Tolstoy wrote of Ruskin, he was one of those rare men who thinks what everyone will think and say in the future. I think even at the last big Ruskin celebration in, two, in the year, in the millennium year 2000, nobody would have anticipated that at the recent a wonderful exhibition at Two Temple Place. The exhibition Two Temple Place would have to put on its website, try and come at a specific time because the exhibition is so crowded, it's very hard to see the works. We expect that for uh, Alexander McQueen at the V&A, but we might not have expected that for Ruskin. And it's a sign of the incredible, I would argue, relevance of his thinking today. So my question about Ruskin is how to mobilize these collections to address the pressing cultural, social, and environmental issues of today. The collection offers the basis for using Ruskinian materials and thinking as a springboard for addressing ongoing social, cultural, and environmental issues strikingly similar to those he addressed himself. So in terms of Ruskin, the other half of my title and the polygon, my question is, how might Ruskin's own working practices offer a model for this? So the cognitive and communication, communicative possibilities of this collection. So Ruskin wrote, I never met with a question yet of any importance, which did not need for the right solution of it, at least one positive and negative answer, like an equation of the second degree. Mostly, matters of any consequence are three-sided, four-sided, or polygonal. And the trotting around a polygon is severe work for people anyway stiff in their opinion. So four-sided or polygonal thought. I want to think about the possibilities of this today. Elsewhere, Ruskin wrote rather wonderfully, one's opinions as thoughts ought to be tested and revisited every five years. So I want to play on this notion of um, multi-sided, multi-possibilities of thought. I've made a collage here of um, the way, I think, putting together some of Ruskin's works, his working habits anticipated many of the opportunities presented by digital technologies today. He combined micro and macro levels of inquiry of both artworks and organic matter. On the right-hand side, these are incredible lecture diagrams he produced for his lectures in Oxford and Edinburgh. They're about six foot 
by five foot, and he choreographed performances of these for his students on the stage. Some of the ones on the left-hand side are one or two inches, incredibly micro investigations of the world around him. He hyperlinked his own on-site documentation, measurement, photography, drawing, and verbal descriptions with reflective texts and regularly cross-referenced this work in public and private letters and documents. He's polygonal also because these collections, so by the Ruskin I mean the Ruskin collections, document almost an entire century of British cultural, economic and social history and afford unique insights into the foundations of artistic, social, scientific and political developments that help to define the cultural movements and the formation of socio-political and environmental thinking and policy and organisations that have continued to define British culture since Ruskin's death all those years ago. At a time when geopolitical expansion of the known world and developments in science were revolutionising our sense of space, the composition of the physical universe and of time, exactly parallel to our own time, Ruskin was asking, what is life? One of his most quoted quotations is, there is no wealth but life. He was asking, whatever life was, it was extending further both into the past and into the future than ever before. And in, in playing with temporality in his works, his works are again surprisingly, to surprisingly topical in his investigations of how, how neither past nor present are reliable guides to the future. He used many new technologies and as well as being in a way our archive, uh, the whole of the 19th century rolled into one body of work. It's an extraordinarily dazzling exploration of new technologies, scientific, optical, and artistic of the 19th century. Um, he was exploring incremental changes in our understanding of life and nature. We have 123 daguerreotypes uh, of the Alps and Venice, mostly. The ones of the Alps are an extraordinary record for us today of climate change and many other aspects of the changing world around us. Where is life, Ruskin asks, what is it? In what case can it be said to exist? Who or what gives it meaning? And these, of course, are increasingly relevant questions today where we ask, where does life begin and end in an increasingly smart internet world? world? So Ruskin and the polygon, he's asking, how do we express new ways of thinking? How do new ways of understanding the world result in new ways of organizing and communicating ideas? And how is meaningful data gathered and used? One way I would suggest um, is to connect across disciplines, another to connect across time, another we're trying to connect through our collections and our building, and another through the way we curate our exhibitions as a form of investigation. But today, I want to talk about three things in terms of polygonal thought. And the first is the importance to Ruskin of micro and macro scales of investigation. I, he said in his diary in 1886, I see everything far and near down to the blue lines on this paper and up to the slow, snow lines on the old man. His work on one hand is a kind of constant morphology, how a stone or a piece of rock can express and iterate larger principles. A stone is a mountain in miniature. Much of Ruskin's work, and I've been thinking about this recently for our launch exhibition, um, occurs at your feet. He is constantly drawing the moss, the very simple things of the natural world around you. 
It's also expressed at the other end of the scale as cloud studies and water studies, minute explorations of geological and botanical specimens, which exemplify these micro and macro scales of perception and the application, the, the extremely skilled application of skilled technologies for exploring the world. Very beautifully, elsewhere in his diary, he describes this as little patches and scratches of the sections and fragments of things. It's beautifully every day and endemically humble. Actually reading that, I thought how kind of proto-modernist, thinking of the Virginia Woolf quotation about scraps and orbs and fragments and how we make meanings of these. So in terms of the micro and macro polygonal, um, Ruskin offers us a range of different probes to elicit information from the material expressive qualities of material culture around us. And he extends our understandings of the term object through and beyond descriptions of the material, their material, visual or spatial pro properties through investigations of the different methodologies for visualization of visible and invisible infrastructures, confronting issues which challenge perception, language and perception at a fundamental level. Um, these dizzying changes of perspective are very um, symbolic of Ruskin's thought. If you look at the movement of the artwork in, in this selection of works, you see he never approaches his brushstroke head on. It's always diagonal. It's always across rather than to the heart of. And one of the things I wanted to stress about the relevance of Ruskin's thinking about the macro and the micro, through my favorite, I'm very allergic actually to portraits of Ruskin because I'm so interested in working outwards from the works. But if I had to choose uh, a portrait, I would choose this one where he more or less depicts himself as a landscape, as a mountain and water. And his extraordinary skill in depicting the natural world is no, is no accident. He claims, and it's, it remains persistently true through his writings or demonstrable through his writings, that this is the starting point of all of his thinking. He said in another lecture, the beginning of all my right work, my right artwork in life, depended not on my love of art, but of mountains and sea. I was listening to David Attenborough talk about the recent demonstrations uh, for protecting our environment in the last couple of weeks. And the quotation could almost be Ruskin. It seems to me, he said, that the natural world is the greatest source of excitement, the greatest source of visual beauty, and the greatest source of intellectual interest. It's the greatest source of so much in life that makes life worth living. But going back to these micro and macro scales of perception, and Ruskin's uh, dizzying and sometimes totally frustrating uh, perambulations across many areas of thought. Very often, you find he'll say of a particular theory or, or body of thought that may be true or it may not be true, but always in terms of the micro and the macro, his thought comes back to the individual and how whatever thought process or methodology has essential value to humanity and how it plays out across a whole constellation of thinking. So in his portraits, we always see him, self-portraits, staring back at himself, asking that question, what does it mean to be human? And in an age where many of our technologies, I still, I came to the Ruskin from the V&A, but I retained a visiting professorship at Imperial College, where I work in the Department of Material Science. And the more I look and work with colleagues on technologies across the sciences, for example, the applications in research terms of big data, 
the more the Ruskinian questions seem increasingly relevant again, because of course, these kind of technologies average out. The question, what does it mean to be an individual, remains pertinent and very prescient. So Ruskin's work offers us his form of, of thinking, not just a range of thought processes and contents, but a powerful set of imaginaries, complex processes of vision and embodiment. He sees the world as an object of science and an object of the human imagination, creati creativity and will. There's constant powered conflict, conflict between these as he um, embodies and then disposes of worlds conjured, constructed, legitim legitimated at will. His concern for environmental issues were prescient, was prescient and remains pertinent. Um, this is a wonderful uh, piece of work. It's um, also video work by the architect and filmmaker Liam Young, Tomorrow's Thoughts Today. And many of the contemporary artists that I would like to work with as we curate for the future are working across the same range of questions, I think, uh, as Ruskin did previously. Um, uh, Liam Young, this filmmaker, says, at the core, we're interested in the roles of futures and fiction to pose questions, not just to find solutions to problem, but to act problems, but to identify new spaces for operation. Ruskin was constantly doing that. This is a piece we commissioned at the v &A for an exhibition uh, by Studio Drift. Beautiful, beautiful, none of the reproductions really show it. It was called Fragile Futures Chandelier, made by embedding tiny, tiny LED lights into dandelion seeds and mounting them in an installation. And the uh, Studio Drift work on the same question about the fragility of the relationship between these many worlds conjured by many forms of material culture and technologies. Ruskin was crucially concerned through the many media of his work of the stewardship of the work of the work of the earth and in terms of his polygonal thinking he constantly asked across the different philosophies and forms of making how constitution of meaning leads to forms of action and inaction and i think his work is powerfully practice based in in these ways he constantly shows us that the more, we, the more we follow the line of new technologies and new theories, the more we have a responsibility to uh, find ways of compensating for increasing social deficits in knowledge and in ethical competencies for our new worlds. So looking is not just a passive activity, observation, is always intervention. And that's what I think Charlotte Bronte was partly getting at when she said, Ruskin has given us a new sense, sight. I don't think she just meant looking. I think she meant what Ruskin said when he said, and he was of course par excellence, a teacher. He wanted his students to, I quote, develop the extreme rarity of fine organic sight. So my second uh, form of um, polygonal thinking is how Ruskin connected represent representational practices through making. Um, for Ruskin, the hand was an instrument of consciousness and it's no accident um, that uh, the hand and the eye work together in, for Ruskin in his making. Um, and I wanted to show you, if you haven't been to Temple Place, one of the things that um, the uh, Temple Place uh, has, has really 
brought out are some of Ruskin's extraordinary models he made of feathers. They are on display at the Ruskin Museum uh, in Coniston. But he was constantly not just trying to make us see the world anew through these dazzling uh, movements between micro and macro perception, but also through, through making. He was an inveterate uh, model maker. It's very fashionable now to talk about studio-led research or practice-based making, uh, but this was precisely what Ruskin was doing. The teaching of art is the teaching of all things. For him, the visual was a mode of cognition, a way of thinking in another mo modality. It wasn't just a way of illustrating what you thought in a different dimension. For Ruskin, sensory awareness, visual aptitude, and draftsmanship were powerful conceptual tools. His work began with attention to the gravity, spatiality, and rhythm of both word and image, form and content. And in these ways, that he doesn't, doesn't translate meaning across different forms of thinking and expression, but accomplishes, accomplishes meaning. For Ruskin, haptic thought, an awareness of touch, temperature, texture, light, shade, focus, and positionality is integral. Perhaps in a different way, that's what, Rus uh, what Keats meant by knowledge proved upon the pulses. Um, here is uh, one of his drawings for that feather. Um, and I just wanted to, wonderful quotation from Charles Bell, a surgeon writing at much the same time, who wrote a book on the anatomy and philosophy of expression, who said, I have often found it necessary to take the aid of a pencil in slight marginal illustrations in order to express what I despaired of making intelligent by the use of language merely, as in speaking of the forms of the head or the operations of the muscles of the face. Um, thirdly, and just before my conclusion, um, I also wanted to talk, third way of thinking about uh, polygonal thought was the museum. Because, of course, in the 19th century, the museum was the place where science, art, and collections met in these fledgling museums. Um, there's a wonderful description in Rudyard Kipling's autobiography of the South Kensington Museum of Rudyard Kipling as a small boy in the museum where his father was curator, and these packing cases after packing cases with extraordinary unknown, hitherto unseen things from across the world um, coming in. Wordsworth described museums even earlier than that as the combination of things by nature most unneighbourly. And museums, of course, have always tasked visitors with things unknown, and they're about pathways to seeing the world anew. Um, they're predicated on the idea of the past, but not necessarily on the idea of the past as past, but the meaning and the dynamism of the past for the present and the future. And as with Ruskin's own work in our collection, objects in a museum need to be animated by their visitors or by the curators to give them meaning and relevance and to make us see the world anew through those. So in conclusion, the polygon, polygon, shouldn't have chosen a title that I can't pronounce, should I? The polygonal nature of um, Ruskin's thinking brings together science, art, evidence and past-based knowledge and creative and imaginative skills with, an, with the aim of an ethically-based wisdom of a new and different kind. Um, in uh, Modern Painters, he describes his thought. Uh, he apologizes to his reader for his, well, for the multi-dimensional nature of his thought. And he says, 
I'm afraid this is a difficult chapter. One of the drawbacks, qualifications, one of drawbacks, qualifications and exceptions. But the more I see of useful truths, the more I find, like human beings, they are eminently biped. His polygonal thinking was so personal, so human-centric, and this was absolutely uh, the, the, um, the significance of his multiple scales of perception, that it could be what else, what elsewhere in his writing he calls beautiful thought, houses for our souls to live in. And when I was thinking about um, where to conclude, I found again a quotation I remembered and had always loved from F.R. Leavis talking about what a university should be. He was talking about the, the two cultures. It was a response to C.P. Snow on the two cultures. And he said, like Snow, I look to the university. Unlike Snow, I'm concerned to make it really a university, something that is more than a collection of specialist departments. To make it a centre of human consciousness, perception, knowledge, judgment and responsibility. In its emphasis on how artworks, images, objects, products and exhibitions affect our lived experience and have the power to change and develop how we, how we encounter and construct our everyday world and ourselves. I believe the collections and Ruskin's work in them are, are within the pulse of everyday life and create the kind of possibilities for thinking for the future uh, that Levis was writing about there and are absolutely uh, across. And I just wanted to end with this vision, which I absolutely love of the Ruskin collection for the future um, as a kind of TARDIS for taking us somewhere else. Thank you very much. Thank you.